Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is Videocast, episode 80, podcast episode 70, for the week ending April 30th, 2021. A lot of great stuff, a lot of detail today. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast, you may want to check out the video cast after you're done just to see some of the charts that we're going to go through. You can do that at hedgefundtips.com. It'll be one of the first few posts that come up. But uh, as always, we're going to kick it off with our media spots for the week, get through some key points there, and then get right on to the sector rotation, some op opportunities that we're taking advantage of, and some things that you may be able to benefit from. So uh, first, I'd like to thank Nicole Petalides and Declan Murphy for having me on the TD Ameritrade Network this week. Uh, they have quite a few people that tune into their uh, platform from Schwab and from TD Ameritrade. So uh, always great to be on the show. And in this segment, we covered the uh, part of the big tech earnings. It was after Microsoft and Google had reported. And the question Nicole asked me was, uh, why was... Google up or Alphabet up and Microsoft was down even though they both had good earnings. And the key with all of this is expectations. So in the case of Microsoft, expectations were very high going into earnings. Um, they exceeded those expectations on some fronts, uh, but then sold off. It was trading at 35 times earnings into the print. Uh, its 10-year average historical multiple is about 28 times. So it was a, a short-term sell the news event. And it kind of reminded me of the Apple earnings from Q1. If you remember on January 27th, uh, Apple reported quote-unquote perfect earnings. And then the stock subsequently sold off almost 20% over the next few weeks. Similar type of situation by the rumor sell the news. And uh, so that's probably going to consolidate for a little while before moving higher. And the other aspect uh, on Google, for instance, the expectations were low because they depend on travel, leisure and hospitality. Advertising uh, is a large part of their sales. So expectations were very low. They were trading at a 32 times multiple into earnings versus a 10 year average of 25 times. However, earnings beat so materially $26.29 a share versus 15.60 estimated that when you look at the forward run rate that that multiple is actually going to come down below their 10 year average or somewhere in the range of their 10, 10 year average. So while uh, Microsoft beat their multiple is still high and it's, it's cooling off, whereas uh, Alphabet beat by such a large margin that the multiple is actually now compressing. Uh, and the price can go up because earnings are going up so dramatically and, and that run rate, you know, from 60 to effectively 100, uh, although it varies by quarter. But but the point is that um, uh, the multiple was reasonable. Now, I think the big story, there are three divisions for each of the of the companies. In the case of Alphabet, they've got Google services, which is the ads. Uh, they were uh, expected to be up 25%. They were up 33%. YouTube was the big story. Um, they were up 48.7%. But you have to think, uh, YouTube just two years ago had 73% of adults watching their station, uh, their, their website. Today, it's 83, 81%. So from 73% to 81%, that's number one. Number two is a billion hours a day of content are being watched on YouTube. It's estimated their forward run rate is going to be about $30 billion of revenue. Now compare that to Netflix, 400 million hours a day of content is being consumed and their revenues are expected to be $29.7 billion. So on a standalone basis, leave the rest of Google aside, YouTube alone could be a bigger business than Netflix. Uh, and it's obviously at a much lower multiple now trading in line with the 10 year average. Uh, so so that, that was the big story uh, from Google. And um, their Google Cloud grew, but it's a tiny part of their business still. It uh, was expected to do 4.07 billion. It did 4.05 billion. Uh, so they're growing up 46%, but it's still small relative to Microsoft Azure and uh, Amazon Web Services. 
As far as Microsoft, they have three different divisions as well, productivity and business processes. And I think this is also part of the reason that uh, you saw a little softness after earnings. Their revenues on that division were expected to be 13.48. They came in at 13.4. It was up 13% on the uh, year on year. And But their LinkedIn was a big growth story, up 23%. They've now got 45.7 million people on MSF, MS Microsoft uh, 365, that's the consumer version. The commercial version is Office 365. Um, and then on the Azure side, and I also think this is why it was a little soft after earnings, 14.9 billion was expected. They got 14.6. Azure was up 50% year on year, um, but it was also up 50% year on year last quarter. So there was some murmuring that the growth rate is starting to slow. I think that may be an overblown fear, number one. Number two, they're growing 50% year on year, put it in perspective. Uh, and finally, their Xbox was up 40%. But the big beat was on, uh, um, uh, in terms of percentage, I mean, Xbox was big. Both of these companies are gonna return a tremendous amount of capital, a lot of buybacks, 10 billion. They did 10 billion of, uh, of uh, return of capital last quarter, 5.8 billion in buybacks for Microsoft, 4.2 billion in dividends. Um, the travel, leisure, and hospitality businesses will start to come back and spend. And uh, Azure has an advantage over AWS in that uh, people have the Teams and the Office 365 embedded, so it's easier to integrate and sell it as a bundle. Whereas if you're buying, you know charging cords on Amazon or books on Amazon, it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily, there's no, there's no synergy with you using AWS. AWS is just a commodity product. Um, so, but, but doing well is uh, also on the alphabet side, they did a $50 billion buyback authorization. So there's going to be a lot of return of capital moving forward uh, in these groups. We're going to talk about Apple uh, a little later in this um in this podcast video cast because th there's some nuances and I and I came came in skeptical and it seemed to be bearing out correctly um, but we'll take it day by day so again thank you to Nicole and Declan for having me back on TD Ameritrade uh, moving right along I want to thank um, Shivani Kumarasan and Sriyasi Sanyal for having me in their Reuters article this was I guess on Tuesday and the quote was the market's in a holding pattern waiting for big tech earnings we could see a bifurcated result in tech earnings with ad providers like facebook and google doing quite well very well while apple coming against uh, coming up against some very tough comparisons year on year um so we'll, we'll parse that out i mean the story with apple i mean the earnings were absolutely phenomenal but the question is and, and i've said this in in many podcasts in the last couple months after those quote unquote perfect earnings in January is where's the next growth catalyst going to come from? They're fumbling the ball on the car. I'm sure they'll have some big announcement on that this year, but I, I do think, you know, talks broke down with Hyundai. It's a huge investment. They're way behind, you know, five to 10 years behind the curve. So it's going to take a long time to catch up before you can start to price that in. Uh, service, you know, actually handsets were better than services. But again, they don't really have a huge ad business, and now their cash cow services is being threatened in a material way, which we'll talk about uh, in 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 just a little bit. So, uh, secondly, second, I want to thank. Uh, this was also an article, a quote in Reuters yesterday, uh, where it said Apple and Microsoft both had high expectations. And while they did exceed consensus estimates, a lot, a lot of it was priced in. So there's some profit taking coming in. Uh, and that's really the story here. Nothing wrong. They have to consolidate in the case of Microsoft. Uh, Apple, again, I think that could be a different story. And we're going to parse that out in, in this call. Uh, a couple, there are a few good quotes of the day I put up this week. And I think they're going to be appropriate based on what we talk about today. Uh, Joel Greenblatt, um, the secret to investing is to figure out the value of something and then pay a lot less. And then I think that ties in with Charlie Munger, the wise ones bet heavily when the world offers them that opportunity. The big, they bet big when they have the odds and the rest of the time they don't. It's just that simple. And that's interesting um, considering uh, this week there was a headline article by Car Carlton English over at Barron's why Wells Fargo is a must-owned stock. 
And now we know that the sentiment is turning after it's up almost 100% now uh, from the low 20s. Uh, when we were pounding the table, the low to mid 20s last year, now it's, uh, I think it closed over 56.50 today or something. Uh, I'm sorry, 46.50. So we're getting up close to $50 a share, uh, up from 22 to 25 range where we were really on top of it with the Cobra Kai article and everything else. So sentiment is changing here. I, I think there's a tremendous amount of juice left in this stock uh, over the next few years. I think in, in the short term, there'll be an opportunity, um, you know, as, as more and more people come in, uh, as the position gets, you know, lopsidedly large in the portfolio from all the gains uh, to, to trim a little bit, but keep the core of it over the next few years, because I think this thing is going to be tremendous. You, you haven't even had the asset cap lift yet. You haven't even had, um, you know, real demand. The reopening's just started. They've got uh, the highest efficiency rate in the, in the business, meaning the highest cost. They can pull another 10, 10 billion of costs out. So many good things in place. They also, uh, because of the asset cap, ironically, uh, they are not overwhelmed with deposits, which is ir ironically hurts you uh, based on capital ratios, et cetera. So they're actually better positioned than JP Morgan and Bank of America because of the punishment. Who would have thought better to be lucky than to be good? Uh, but uh, so everything's lining up for them. Very exciting to see the change of sentiment after it's up 100%. And, um, and to Carlton's credit, by the way, she in July was was one of the only people other than myself, and I think that's basically it, maybe one other, uh, talking about Cecil and how the accounting changed, how they had to overstate credit reserves, and all those are coming back as earnings. Uh, very few people were on top of that, and uh, so give Carlton a lot of credit because she was there in the beginning, and now she's there when, when the momentum is just getting started. So uh, great job on that front. And then um, there, here's an article, no surprises in President Biden's reported capital gains proposal, a 28% rate looks most likely Goldman Sachs. So, you know, last week I was uh, quoted in Reuters, you know, when the, they announced this 43% nonsense, uh, the market sold off like the Dow rather sold off the 300 points and Reuters called me up. I said, uh, you know, if it actually had a chance of passing, we'd be down 2000 points. And uh, I think that's that's going to prove to be the case. Uh, one, the vast, vast majority of money is institutional uh, anyway, so the, the capital gains rate doesn't matter. Number two, um, initially, it's only going to be for the very wealthy. But if you do the math, you could double the tax, all the taxes on the wealthy, and you still wind up at less than a third of what Biden needs to put out all of his plans. So um, they're coming for the middle class. It's just no one knows it yet. And uh, and, and actually they do because uh, it starts at 400,000 per household, which was not what was campaigned on. It was if you don't earn more than 400,000, your taxes won't go up. Uh, now it's a household. So if you got you know a wife making 300 and a husband making 100 or 200 each, uh, you know, on the coasts, that's that's you know, it, that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's good, but it's, it's not, you know, when you start having to give 59% to the government between state and local, it gets, uh, it's, it's a different story. So, um, so look, this is going to come in more moderate on the capital gains. It only affects, I think about 170, I think it was $178 billion of assets. So it's, it's really de minimis as it relates to the stock market. The rate's going to be a lot less than people expect. Um, and, uh, and that's the story there. The other thing that I, I thought was really interesting, I heard a stat in the last 24 hours that if Biden gets half of his, I'm sorry, if he gets a, th okay, what, between what's been done and what he's asking for in the family plan and the infrastructure plan, et cetera. If he only gets half of what is on the table with the infrastructure and the, um, and the family plan, which, you know, largely he can push whatever he wants through, through reconciliation because they want everything. So, um, so, so it's probable. However, uh, both with the taxes, I, I'm cognizant of the fact that there are many centrist Democrats 
and sensible, uh, thoughtful people in the House and the Senate that uh, are probably not going to let this go through at the ask. It'll be somewhere between the bid and the ask in the middle, and uh, and it'll be more sensible. But but assuming reason prevails, which I think it will, both on the tax rates uh, and on the spending being more moderate. Uh, this is going to be so so if he got 100 percent of his ask it would be dramatically larger than fdr's new deal in inflation adjusted terms the dollar amount of the spend is more dramatically more than was spent during the great depression by fdr and if he gets half of what he's asking for half of the new spending in the family plan and in the uh, infrastructure plan, it's still larger than FDR's New Deal during the Great Depression. So why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because the economy is growing. Uh, things are in place. The vaccines are going along as, as scheduled. The cases are coming down. The deaths are coming down dramatically. We're going to hit critical mass probably in the next one to two to three months where it just falls off the map uh in a good way so this amount of spending is concerning and people are obviously setting themselves up uh uh for inflation hedges you're seeing it in the real estate markets i talked to you about the hotel markets you're seeing it in commodities hitting all-time high uh this is a wish list of um a political and soci uh, social ideology which you know you can agree with or disagree with it. it may be right it may be wrong and and i think everyone's all for helping everyone who needs it and i and and that's very very important but you also have to spend within the realm of reason there has to be some math attached to the ideas and um you know what we're seeing now with the gdp growth we're seeing you know it's going to be north of nine percent by the time the year is over uh and everything else and that's with the packages that are already approved and rolling out just kicking in. They, they, we don't even have the six to nine month lag on some of the packages that are already out and we're seeing this level of inflation. Then to add another three, four trillion dollars on top of it, it's it's uh, it's imprudent to put it mildly. So um, so just keep an eye on these numbers. So so the point is you you want to be in real assets like you don't want to be in cash in this environment and i'm not a hyperinflationist i'm not a gold bug i'm not a hide under the shelf and you know get cans of food and all that stuff I, we're not going there there are disinflationary forces part of its demography although the millennials are bigger than the baby boomers now so that that story is not holding as well um a lot of its techno technological advances that that's disinflationary and that's a, that's positive and constructive and productivity uh so there will be some offsets it's not going to be runaway certainly the fed has some tools to slow it down as it starts to get ahead of it the question is how far behind the curve is he going to get and he told us this week he's going to get as far behind the curve as humanly possible uh but his heart and intent is correct which is he saw what happened during the great financial crisis he does not want structural unemployment where you know a bunch of people in their mid 40s and mid 50s can never get a job again because they got pushed out due to covid and they never get back in because there's a bunch of them that that happened in uh um you know in, in the 2008 to 2016 period and they never really returned and that's why you had the opioid uh, part of the reason you had mass opioid epidemic uh, you have massive amounts of people go on long-term disability. Uh, you know, miraculously, we had all of these people that became, you know, chronically disabled like we've never had in percentages. And the reason is, is because there was no way back in. So there was structural unemployment. And Powell saw that and he decided that I, I'll let this thing run hot. You know, if you got to pay $15 for a hero sandwich instead of $9.95, that's what's going to happen so we can make sure everyone's working even even if it's twice as much at the tank even if you know it becomes difficult to get into a new house for for first time home buyers uh at least everyone will be working and and i think there's immense merit to that because the value and the dignity of work 
is significant and um, you can deal with inflation over time. And we know we have the tools historically to do that. Uh, the question is the short-term pain that you experience when you do rein it in, but uh, I'm with him. So we know what's coming. I think on the fiscal side, the voices of reason will come to bear and it won't be so dramatic. It'll be something in between. And that should more than offset the middle ground on the higher personal taxes and the higher corporate taxes that'll offset any losses from that. So I think when all is said and done, we'll have modest inflation that won't be transient will have continued growth and then um, over the next five to seven years we will grow our way out of you know 120 percent plus debt to gdp as we did post world war ii when we borrowed to fight a visible enemy in this case we borrowed to fight an invisible enemy but we don't want to be reckless about it uh, in terms of when we look at it compared to what we did in the middle of the depression, which we didn't have this time, we had a recession, um, although it could have been a depression if not for Steven Mnuchin, by the way, all-star player, and Larry Kudlow and Nancy Pelosi, by the way, she got it done as well. Uh, so what they came to, to do in, in March and early April saved this from a long-term Great Depression. So hats off to that bipartisan cooperation in the crisis and they did a massive plan the most massive plan ever so to keep doing that size plan over and over and over when we're out of the woods uh you know uh, I, I i think cooler heads will prevail so uh the other good thing that came out of all these other announcements from the administration is that pre prescription drug price cuts set to be left out of the white house proposal so that's now off the table although the market is not really acknowledging that yet and they will. So, and when will they acknowledge that? They're going to acknowledge that, for instance, Merck sold off like crazy today on earnings. They missed on top and bottom line. Why did they miss? Because doctor visits were, were still dramatically impaired and two thirds of what they manufacture and produce can only be administered via a doctor visit. So it has to be doctor um, administered in person, 66% of the drugs that they make. So of course their sales were down. But when you look at the back half of the year and people go back to their doctors, they stop worrying about COVID, they start worrying about cancer and heart, high blood pressure and uh, cholesterol and all the, the maintenance things that you have to do to stay healthy, those prescriptions are gonna go through the roof. And it's not just gonna be Merck, it's gonna be all these companies right now that are being handed to us on a silver platter uh, manna from heaven and most people like always wall street is the only place when they hold a sale no one shows up and that's what's happening in in big pharma and we took advantage of it this week we'll talk a little bit more about that today um okay one of the meme stocks is off to the races nokia earnings were surprisingly good the stock is soaring look this is a play the new ceo um pekka lundmark has uh was very successful in his past uh, careers and he's come over he's shaken the tree in Nokia huge 5g play behind Ericsson uh, this is great to see I think there's actually a great thesis here it was nice to see them finally beat it looks like it's finally coming out of a long-term slumber where you can get exposure to uh, a, a business that's going to be in enormous demand over the next five to ten years it's kind of an oligopoly business globally and now that they've got the right leader at the helm, I think this uh, breakout is real. I don't think this is a fake out. I think this thing's going to run. Northrop Grumman, uh, in, in terms of defense stocks, they beat and, and raised guidance. So that's good. You're, you're seeing the defense stocks come out of their slumber. Uh, Royal Dutch Shell gain, raised the dividend, beat, uh, and uh, they're doing good. Chevron and Exxon. McDonald's revenue tops pre-pandemic levels fueled by the strong U.S. recovery. Yeah, that's helped, number one. Number two, 150,000 restaurants have gone out of business because the, the government shut them down. Uh, so, uh, you know, by the way, if you're a good cook, there's probably never been a better time in the history of the United States to start a new restaurant. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I love uh, Guy Fieri, uh, uh, diners, drive-ins, and dives. When we travel, we try to hit all the spots that he's been to. Uh, and my eldest daughter loves to watch it with me. Uh, but uh, now, now's the time. So I think that as certainly all of the big chains uh, will be in the 
driver's seat for the next few quarters. But as small bit as small businesses start to reopen, new restaurants start to reopen, they'll gain back share, and uh, and you can peel out of some of these that have had huge runs uh, in anticipation of that. Uh, okay, this is the big story on Apple. We talked about this actually the, the first time I was in Tampa, which was in December. And I, I did a segment for CGTN about the Digital Services Act in the EU, if you recall. Uh, and I said, this is going to be a big headwind because what they said in that, uh, this is the lady, uh, yeah, Mar Marguerite Vestigar. You'll remember the name. I covered it in December on the podcast video cast. Um, they basically saying, you know, they're going after anti-monopolistic tendencies and uh, their penalty is up to 10% of revenues. And if you recall, I said, this is effectively just, you know, this is just a shakedown for money. If, it, it, when you cut through it all, it's like huge honeypot. They want their piece. They don't have big tech in Europe. They want a piece of the action. In the last administration, they said, you're not taking money from our tech companies. If anyone's going to take money from them, it's going to be us. And that's why we started all the investigations at the Justice Department, et cetera. And, and, and that's that. I think with the new administration, these, you know, these groups, uh, the European commissioner is going to have more free reign to do what she wants. Uh, and we're seeing it starting today, which it didn't happen uh, for four years uh, otherwise. And her first huge target is now Apple. And this is a material claim that she's making that the agreements, the app developers have to pay 30% commission on all subscription fees that come through the app store. Uh, this, you know, this is very interesting because I think they have a very solid case. I mean, effectively, Apple says, because a lot of people use our phone, no matter what your business is, we get a 30% cut. It, it reminds me of like the mafia, you know, protection in the neighborhood. It's like, you know, <laughs> if you don't pay us a, por a portion of your top line, you're going to have problems. Uh, you know, you need our protection. It's like, wait, I never had any problems before you came in. Well, it's the same thing with the EU commission. They're saying you're going to have to pay us uh, and, and work this out. And, and Apple is saying, hey, if you want access to you know, all of the, the customers around the world, you got to pay us for, for that access, which I think is kind of, you know, there should be another way that these companies should be, the, the consumer should be able to go to their website and down, download an app, whether they have an Apple phone or a uh, Android phone. Um, even if they can't get it through the convenience of the app store, they should be able to go to a browser and download it to their phone. Uh, so if the EU is successful with this, this risks a material portion of the services business, which is the whole growth story moving forward. And uh, so obviously it's going to take years to fight this out. Apple has a tremendous uh, uh, reserve to fight it, legal reserves, but the case is pretty compelling. Uh, certainly if you're a developer, you agree with this. As a consumer, your cost of using most of these apps would go down if Apple wasn't the middleman. They provide no value add whatsoever. I mean, the, the app is developed. If, if you could get it off the website of the individual like Spotify or whatever, what what benefit does, does what value add does Apple provide by just being the gatekeeper? Absolutely zero. So definitely those margins are gonna compress, if not be entirely eliminated. And then the growth story is completely changed and i think that's why you're seeing this headwinds and i knew this was lurking in the background certainly we had the antitrust in the u.s and all the states that we've been talking about with big tech but you know that that was a lot of like theatrics you know come come for a hearing let's berate you we'll meet in another three months and we'll meet right before the election and yell at you and do nothing uh but europe does not have that obligation to do nothing because they have no political interest in Apple. Apple, you know, so uh, we have to watch this because this is a pretty strong case, and I think that the market will start to discount the possibility of this. It'll apply some probability, which is the headwind, despite "quote unquote" perfect earnings, and the the stock could drift down. I think in anticipation of this, and until they get a new growth catalyst to displace this this huge material risk to the business, which if 
ruled against them in Europe, you can be sure in the United States developers are going to be pushing to get Parry Pursue treatment and in Asia. So that whole services revenue becomes becomes an issue. And as the stock sinks, and then of course they'll come out with the big material car announcement and people start to look forward to that because that's a much bigger business and a whole operating system for the car and yada, yada, yada. And people will forget about the phone and then the stock will go back up. But I think before then, this this is a big, big deal. And it was down a little bit today on this, but uh, I think this kind of starts to explain why after that January 27th peak, we've not hit new highs despite this continued quote unquote good news. And um, and that's why I've been a little bit, you know, um, cautious on this one for, for some time. Okay, Goldman Sachs sees $80 oil this year. That's good news. From their lips to God's ears, I hope so. We've got plenty of uh, energy exposure from last year that's doing great. We'll talk a little bit about that as, uh, as we move forward. Here's another story. Uh, Apple's earnings were spectacular. Why its stock has dropped. Um, and they're not even mentioning the... Um, the real risk, which is the services risk. Sakanagi, who's a great analyst on this, said, will there be a trough on the other side as COVID-driven wallet share shift returns to normal? We think the answer is unequivocally yes. It's just hard to know when, how big that might be. We believe that iPad and Mac strength could persist for the next few quarters, but even if the work from home trend persists, we doubt the surge will rival this year's. So that was what I'd been talking about. The, a lot of demand was pulled forward in Q2 of last year with work from home and with uh, study from home, and that's going to go away. Also, you had huge stimulus checks in fourth quarter and first quarter uh, of this year. So that's done for now. Um, uh, so, so he makes a salient case on that point, but the real risk, I think, is the risk to that 30% you know, protection fee, that mafia protection fee, adding zero value to the business and yet taking a huge cut uh, of the developer's action is just crazy. So uh, they're coming for it. Now, Apple versus Epic. So this is the US version of that exact same antitrust lawsuit, which now the EU commission has said is valid. And this is just gonna be the same version in the US. And if the EU does something about it, that's gonna influence, probably create precedent for the US. Uh, Exxon and Chevron surged back to profit. That was good to see. And we'll look at their what their stock looks like um, uh, in just a minute. Uh, this is from Ryan Dietrich. Personal savings back up to more than $6 trillion. There were stimulus checks, I believe, in the last four weeks. This is the second highest ever to the first stimulus check, which was in early uh, or mid-2020. It's a lot of cash on the sidelines. Uh, so certainly some of this will go into the stock market. A lot of it's going to go into the uh, marketplace into spending uh and that'll be a very positive thing so it's good to see that number that was out today and then this is from um uh, michael hartnett over at bank of america he does the global fund manager survey but he had a note out and he said uh cash sees largest weekly inflows since march 20th uh march of 2020 now if you remember march of 2020 that was the bottom um of the stock market cash funds attracted the largest inflows at 57.3 billion in the week through april 28th bonds drew 13.7 billion and equities received 10.5 billion investors are positioning for inflation and tapering right strategists led by michael hartnett also citing strong inflows into bank loans at 3.9 billion in the last four weeks bank loans are um uh, the interest rate adjusts so people are are uh, getting ready for rates to go higher so they want to be in instruments where uh, they don't lose half their principal as rates go up uh, and case for inflation building with asset price inflation now mutating into real estate commodities and ceafe and emerging markets so europe and emerging market cyclicals offering inflation heads for equity investors inflows to european equities continued for a second week with 1.3 billion private client client exposure stands at 64.3 percent stocks 18.2 debt 11.3 percent cash which is high that's you know there's a wall of worry narrative in that as well that the higher it goes the more it's going to force that in uh, we might be due for a breather here we'll get into that in a little more detail but again, since day one of this year, we've been saying, ignore the general indices, look for the rallies under the surface. And that's what we've done. That's our knitting. We've played the sector rotation. We're going to delve into that in great detail moving forward. Um, 
largest weekly outflow, largest weekly equity outflow since June 2019 on capital gains tax announcement. Okay, so that was a knee-jerk reaction, I think, from a lot of people, and institutions haven't moved any money on that basis because they're not at, at the effect. Some high net worth people, the, the biggest stocks that will uh, be impacted by the um, larger capital gains, which is not going to be 43%. Again, I think it'll be closer to 28, if that. Uh, and that's for, again, the top uh, three tenths of 1%, um, which is about 500,000 households. It's about 178 billion. So it's not an enormous amount of households, but it does dramatically impact, you know, venture capital, uh, people with options, um, you know, all these people that are working startups. It's huge. And, and, it, and it will really hurt investment into new businesses because people think about how it's so it's going to have widespread impacts. That's the bad news. The good news is the number is not going to be 43. It's probably going to be in the 20s, if that so that's good news. Uh, qu another quote from Benjamin Graham, in the short term, the market's a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. So let's take a look at some of the voting versus weighing. Uh, last week, we talked about starting to get exposure to, um, you know, last year, it was energy, banks, and uh, defense and aerospace, we pounded the table. Those have all done very nicely. Uh, eight weeks ago, it was utilities, um, Staples and Big Pharma, those have had a great run. And then last week we started with uh, very selectively lower conviction. So we're doing a wider basket, some Chinese stocks that have been bitten, uh, beaten down and then busted SPACs. What do I mean by that? It's largely, certainly some SPACs that have not announced a deal that have really good jockeys. We're betting on the jockey, um, like uh, really established people in their businesses like Terry Pegula. He owns the uh, Buffalo Sabres. He's made, uh, he's become a billionaire in the oil patch and he's done it through cycles where when no one wants it, he buys beaten down assets and then he flips them five years later to, to the big companies and that's how he made his billions. So he's got a SPAC that he's out in the market uh, looking to buy energy assets. That's the guy I wanna bet on because I think we're at the early stages of a commodity cycle three to five years and a guy like that uh, will find a good asset and it will be a good thing. So something like uh, E-R-E-S-U, we talked about these facts. So it had a it had a nice, uh, decent move this week. I think this one did. Um, yeah, so it's starting to move, but you know, it had been basing here. This is what we call a busted SPAC. It, it, all these SPACs were hot on hype and now they've all crashed and that's when we get interested. We don't get involved when everyone's excited and everyone's clamoring for things. We get involved when there's value and it's left for dead and we see opportunity and it's a good business or a good jockey or ideally both. And in this case, it's our way to get long dated exposure, which we covered a lot last week in, uh, and we like these uh, long dated warrants uh, because you can get exposure to some of these for a buck, a couple bucks for five to six years, and uh, you'll get the benefit of an announcement if they haven't done an announcement. And then with some of these that have done an announcement that have spiked up on the announcement and now rolled over, why have they rolled over? Because you're in an information vacuum. They either haven't changed the ticker yet from the SPAC ticker to the new co-ticker, so no one knows, uh, or they... Um, we did this with DraftKings, by the way. I think it was, um, you know, it was some weird ticker. No one was paying attention. It was announced not this year. It was the year before around Christmas time. No one was paying attention. They announced DraftKings. No one was paying attention. Uh, you could get the warrants. The warrants wound up being like a 20X uh, and probably more. We sold early, but, you know, you, bulls, bulls make money, bears make money, pigs get slaughtered. The moral of the story is I think there are a lot of those opportunities again. So we're buying a huge basket because the, you know, more than 50% will fail, but the ones that work are 5X, 10X, 20X over the next one to five years. And um, it's, it, and because the baby's being thrown out with the bathwater, these SPACs uh, and SPAC warrants in particular, everyone's just dumping them. And I love that. So it shows you know, where we are and, uh, you know, so you can just see some of these 
uh, we've we've done a, a really big basket PAE FTCV ACIC o OUST. This one started to rip this week. Um, PAE started to get a bid this week. DMS started to get a bid this week. SNPR not a bid yet, but we we bought that. FOA we bought this week. It's ripped higher. So that's exciting to see. That's uh, Finance of America. They've got a really interesting story if you Google it. Um, LSEA, Land and Sea, they're a home developer. Why wouldn't you want a developer? There's no supply in the market. And uh, you can see what these guys do. They're, they're, their warrants are a little strange. It's like a 10 for one. You might want to just buy the stock if you're interested. Uh, again, this is not, you know, an 80 year old woman should not be buying SPAC warrants. So again, I deal with accredited investors. This is not investment advice. This is opinion. Talk with your financial advisor, do your own due diligence. But I'm just telling you, you know, the things that we're looking at and the things that we're doing and why, we're, how we're thinking about it and uh, for informational and entertainment purposes only. Uh, okay, so this is uh, Terry Pegula's uh, SPAC here. And then uh, UWMC, look, this is a huge mortgage business. Um, uh, I wanna be in this business for the next five years, hands down. This demand is not going away. We need supply from the home builders. We need um, uh, financing providers. That's why we love love Wells Fargo. Now it's become such a large position in our portfolio um, from appreciation. But this is another story, UWMC, that you can get long dated exposure. And as this thing develops and as they continue to report growing earnings, I think the stock is trading at like six, seven or eight times. I haven't looked at it in a little bit, but... Um, this business is only going to grow. Obviously, it's competing with Rocket. There's a lot of competition, but there's going to be demand like we haven't seen in more than a decade. It's already showing up. And as the home builders put on supply, that demand is going to get bigger and bigger. And uh, and that's exciting. And then some clean energy things. Who knows what will work? Here's Fisker. They've been around forever doing uh, private placements, you know, burning through cash. But, you know, if the government's going to subsidize it with $178 billion and put all these charging stations on, at least the narrative will play whether the businesses ultimately work. You know, I, you know, that's, that's just uh, who knows, but you know, the businesses could work for a long time as that narrative plays out and you want to have some exposure. And if you can do so without putting a lot of capital out with getting long dated warrants when they're beat down and no one's paying attention to them, that's a opportunity of a lifetime. In my view, when you buy a basket and you do it in, in manageable and uh, prudent size. Uh, second thing we talked about between besides SPAC warrants and clean energy was that some high quality China stocks have really been beaten down in the last uh, two months. And we love that. You know, when, when the market sells things off 20 to 40, 50 percent and the underlying business economics are still growing, uh, we want to get involved. So if the business is impaired and earnings have fallen off uh, and revenues are declining or slowing, we're not interested. Some things are cheap for a reason. But when it's done because of a, a, a narrative that the Chinese government's cracking down, and they are cracking down, but I think that's more than priced in with some of these stocks down over 50% in two months with growing earnings, growing revenue. So if so, what if they don't grow 40% a year? What if they only grow 15 or 20% a year? Uh, these are tremendous opportunity. You know, in China, it's always the Tesla of China, the Netflix of China, the Amazon of China. So, uh, you know, all of these are the X, Y, Z of China and we wanna have exposure to them. We got just a huge basket because again, we don't have high conviction on any single one. You know, you could get a delisting of one, but the basket as a whole should be materially higher uh, next year, even if a few don't work. Uh, we got Baba, Douyu, Huya, IQ, Las Vegas Sands is now a pure play Asia. They sold off their U.S. assets. And Melco Crown is a, uh, is a pure play Asia casino and resort. So we like this story as the vaccinations accelerate in China. And as that gets opened up, they've opened up the, uh, they opened up a lot of the uh, uh, travel restrictions in uh, the end of last uh, fourth quarter and first quarter. So people are starting to now get to Macau and that's gonna be a, a huge cash cow pent up demand. Now, uh, the eight weeks ago, if you recall the utilities, they just took off like a bat out of hell after um, we put out the article last week of February, first week of March. Uh, they've all just gone straight up. And then in the last week, they took a breather. 
and we were saying this is an opportunity to buy. We think they've got another leg in them. And, you know, we'll see if this follows through. But the last two days, that's proven to be the case. Uh, they're now getting bid. So we had this monster move, uh, weak consolidation. And now it looks like it wants to resume that trend. And our favorite two, our biggest holdings in the space, Dominion, which we've been talking about for eight weeks publicly and on the podcast. Uh, and where's the other Dominion and AEP. So huge moves. One week consolidation now, it looks like it wants to make the next left, same with Dominion, but they're all making a similar pattern and there's a lot of good quality stuff here. So um, we're excited to see how that plays. And why that's also important, the utilities, staples and pharma is they're defensive. So if we do come across some chop, some headwinds and all that stuff, these are gonna outperform because that's where institutional money goes to hide. Um, okay, the next group of defenses is, um, Consumer staples. So we're looking at the household and personal care products. This is manna from heaven. Uh, these sell-offs, um, like you saw Kimberly Clark because people stopped using, they bought every piece of toilet paper under the sun. So year on year, their sales were down. We used this opportunity to top up big this week on Kimberly Clark. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. In our view, I, this is, let, let's not, let's clarify that. Wells Fargo was an opportunity of a lifetime last year. That we said, that's turned out to be true. This is a great opportunity. It's not an opportunity of a lifetime. It's a great opportunity. And uh, I think Clorox, by the way, today, I think that's going to prove to play out uh, nicely as well. I think that's kind of interesting moving forward. Colgate actually beat. So they you know, had their huge run, consolidated for two weeks, and now they seem to be back on the way up. Uh, same with a lot of these. They had, Procter & Gamble had a two-week consolidation. Now, now it seems to be on the way back up. Kimberly Clark, I think that's a unique situation. You got a second bite at the apple and uh, and we took it. Um, okay, what is this? This is utilities again. Okay, so that's not what we want. Let's just see here. Uh, okay, so that's drugs. Okay, we want drugs. We want uh, pharma, big pharma. Okay, so let's get that. All right, good. So um, Merck, we covered this, by the way, and this this group has been the laggard group in the utility staples and uh, big pharma. I think this is a huge opportunity. These are all trading at certainly below market multiples, most of them around 10 to 12 times, some of them even in single digits. Um, Pfizer has had a great run since that March low from 33 to it got up to close to 40. Now it's pulled back for a couple of days and I think it started to resume today. So yeah, again, there, from 33 up to 39 and a half in, a, in six weeks and then it pulled back, consolidated and now it seems like it wants to make another move higher. Um, I think Merck is gonna be another opportunity to get exposure there. Biogen, again, you see these since last year. If you look out at the longer dated chart, there's still huge opportunity. GlaxoSmithKline, by the way, the one that Elliott took a multi-billion dollar stake in as an activist, that's going to be an opportunity. Gilead today was down on earnings, huge in the morning. We took that opportunity to get exposure uh, longer dated, and uh, we think that's going to be a decent play. Their HIV has some headwinds, but they have so many different partnerships, uh, cash and other opportunities going on, plus their remdesivir is doing well. That's probably going to sell a ton in India with the case spikes. A lot of good things happening here. And then uh, Novartis is our favorite, by the way. And this thing was weak. I think this is an opportunity for some time. We've covered it a lot in recent weeks on the um, uh, on the podcast and on TV. And if you take a look at the long dated uh, chart of Novartis, besides the fact that it trades at a historic multiple of 22 times, it's now trading at 12 times. You get a dividend yield two and a half times the 10 year yield. You've got a great pipeline. You've got two blockbuster drugs that as soon as the uh, second half patient visits go normalized, these prescriptions are going to go through the roof. Market's going to start to sniff that out. But look, you've had a five year, six year consolidation in this stock. It's basically gone sideways. The last time you had that was from 2007 to 2012, and then it just took off like a bat out of hell. You had it again in the early 2000s, a five-year consolidation, and then it just took off. So in this case, it nearly doubled over the next few years. In this case, 
40 to 77, so nearly doubled over the next couple of years. And it just looks like it's breaking out here. And I think this stock, I don't know about double, but I don't think that uh, 140 or 150 is, is out of the question. I think this is an incredible opportunity and you're paid to wait. And that's why we got more exposure this week on the, on the weakness. We love this group and we love this stock. So, um, so that's what we're doing. Again, you know, do your own due diligence, talk with your own financial advisor. Uh, but we're just telling you how we're thinking about things. Here are some of the generics. VTRS, by the way, Viatris, this stock has been in the doghouse. This is the old Mylan. They've got the EpiPin. I know there was a problem of pricing with that. They've got a generic business. All the generics have been in the tank. I think they're going to come back in demand. You've got to have a longer term view. Just buy the stock. Don't buy, any, uh, don't buy uh, as much you know, premium because you've got to get the timing right. But I think as you look three, four years out, some of these are going to be doubles, triples, quadruples. Teva is starting to get a bid. VTRS. Takata is the Japanese version. I think there's some value in these groups in the generics. But certainly the brand names, the big pharma, we have huge exposure. Uh, we have exposure to uh, Pfizer. Pfizer and Novartis are two biggest. And we've started to use weakness to add some of these others that are great opportunities. And... Um, uh, we'll continue to do so. Um, okay, so moving along, and again, just to take a look at that Novartis again, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, this is a work of art. I, sh I should make it an NFT and sell it for $100 million or whatever they're doing with these crazy. Okay, so nonetheless, um, all right, moving along to our other groups, uh, what is this? This is energy, so just an update on energy. You know, if you look at these refiners, they, they're, um, they're up huge since November. They've consolidated the last few weeks and it looks like they're ready to go again. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, same thing, Petrobras, you've got BP. They're all reporting great earnings, Valero, um, uh, Royal Dutch Shell reported great earnings. So again, they've had these huge moves, uh, basically what, 22 to 44. So they went up like 100% in six months. They've consolidated for a few weeks, waiting to make the next leg higher. Uh, as you can see, let me just put this out on a monthly basis. These things are really just getting going for the most part. Um, what else are we looking for? So BP, same type, same story, B. Suncor. I mean, these are all high quality names. Um, Occidental, ExxonMobil and Chevron beat today. These are just getting started. Schlumberger, the best servicer in, in the area. They're just getting started. So, so there's still tremendous opportunity, despite the fact that many are up, you know, 80, 100, 125 percent. They still have a long way to go in our view. Uh, Banks. Banks have been monsters, um, but they look like they have some more bid to them here as that 10 year creeps back up. Uh, as I said, the other last week, I think it was the commercials were buying, but not in a not in a size that I, I thought represented a real bottom. I thought there was an intermediate term counter trend rally, which has so far shown to be the case. Uh, the 10 year tick back up from 150 to 165. And banks have been the beneficiary. Wells Fargo with being the big, biggest beneficiary in the last week or so. Uh, City looks like it's consolidating here for a next leg higher. Uh, what is some Bank of America actually broke out here. So again, the, these, there's just so much opportunity under the surface. And then uh, Northrop Grumman, it wasn't too long ago I was saying there's still opportunity here. Get involved. Lockheed Martin, they were down in this area. At the beginning of the year, we were pounding the table on these. Raytheon's now breaking out here. Boeing, I think this is an opportunity. This short-term consolidation investigation, you know, at, at some point, you know, when you have 100 investigations, people start to tune it out. When the stock, stock stops going down on bad news, you've got to get exposure. So I think this is going to be an opportunity and, uh, and some areas. But look at, look at General Dynamics. This thing was in the doghouse. We were pounding the table. No one wanted it. Now that it's up here, people are starting to get interested. So you know, that's just the way it works. And um, I love this game. It, this game is, it, it's not a game, but I mean, this is the greatest business in the world. I mean, it, it's like a treasure hunt every single day of the year. So anyway, moving along, Chuck Berry's riding along stock market. <laughs> the reason I chose this song is because 
if you look at the last uh, two or three weeks, the market has basically been going sideways. It's like watching paint dry and his uh, lyrics were cruising and playing the radio with no particular place to go. Uh, that's, that's what it certainly felt like. I think that's probably going to change. We'll see how that shakes out. Uh, covered the um, show with Nicole already. And then, uh, and then we talked about what happened after the last perfect earnings report with Apple on January 27th and the sell-off afterwards, which we had uh, spoken about. And, um, uh, and then here we are, I think we traded down to like 131 after these perfect earnings. So it seems to be repeating that perfect earnings and then sell-off and we've gone through the key reason is not that the STEMI checks are running out, that's part of it. It's if that service revenue gets impaired, their whole growth story is toast. So, um, which means they're a great business and gonna be around forever and gonna continue to grow, but not at the same rate, which means the multiple, which is seven turns above their 10 year average is gonna normalize and come down to where their growth level will be if those service revenues, which was the growth story gets impaired until they get a new growth story, which will be the car. But you can't just say we're talking to Hyundai and thinking everyone's gonna believe the story. You actually have to have a signed up deal and a real plan to spend $200 billion to make it happen, which uh, which they will have. I just don't, I, you know, you, they're, they're five years late. So when they do it, they're gonna try to do it right. Hopefully it won't be another Apple TV debacle. Uh, but they can't afford to have that. So I think that they'll be fine. You know, they didn't create the first smartphone, by the way. There were um, tablets in the 90s that you could touch pads and everything else. So there were plenty of people that came out before them. They just got it right. They think that they can do that with the car. That's fine. The question is, where will the stock be when they finally do make that announcement? And that might be one of the greatest generational opportunities to buy Apple if it does trade down material over the next few months on this digital services and on this major threat to its business model in our view. Uh, okay, so uh, now we talked about what will happen next. It's hard to say for Apple, but for the NASDAQ with Facebook, Google, Microsoft, all showing secular strength, there may be some gas in the tank, whether Apple participates or not. And we talked to, you know, we pointed to a couple of these indicators. We looked bullish percent composite, you know, it's not elevated. It's certainly higher than average, but this is not the level that things necessarily roll over from. This is the level that you start to worry about. And that's where we did see those big 20% corrections and some stocks were down 40 plus percent. Some of the SaaS stocks, et cetera. Some of the new IPOs are, have gotten pounded. So that's kind of in the question is, is there another leg lower here? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, Apple, I think is gonna be a headwind, but it was for since August effectively, it's, it's not done a lot. So, um, I think the market can do fine. I think the NASDAQ can do fine. I think some of these beaten down SaaS stocks can start to get a bid and that'll probably keep this normalized without, you know, collapsing and maybe even take a leg higher here. That, that'll be interesting to see. Uh, same thing with the McClellan summation for the NASDAQ. Again, it's closer to where you have an inflection upward versus where you roll over. Um, Okay, we took our own advice on April 8th, added some selected tech stock in recent days and weeks. Here's what we said. We'll look for very selective opportunities in tech and SaaS, particularly in stocks that have fallen 20 to 40% in the last few weeks and be less impacted by tough comps for Q1 and Q2. This is not a wholesale call on tech as we believe certain pockets will continue to face headwinds. And then, um, you know, we talked about utility staples and, uh, and banks and energy. And then here's energy, by the way, banks and energy. To, oh, so the reason we requoted this is because um, we said on April 8th, we continue to hold banks, energy and defense stocks uh, from much lower levels last year and would not be surprised if they continue to take a breather before resuming their uptrend and new highs later this year. Well, that's exactly what happened. We did get the breather in energy and banks uh, for sideways and down in the case of energy. And now it looks like they are in fact inflecting and maybe they could make a run, new, a run to new highs here, we'll, we'll see. But this shows us that they're not overbought, that's for sure. Question is, are they gonna stabilize here? And the answer usually is after such a dislocation, the answer is yes, we'll see. If you're listening to the podcast, you're gonna get cut off in 52 seconds. Just go to hedgefundtips.com. Uh, it'll be the first or second post. The video cast is a YouTube video. Fast forward to minute 60 
that will pick up word for word exactly where you left off and you'll be able to catch the last 10 or 15 minutes. We've got a lot of good stuff, detailed stuff to go into. You definitely want to tune in for that. And then you may want to go back and look at some of the charts that we just covered on a sector by sector basis just to put a visual to the audio that you just listened to. Because um, there is so much going on right now that we do try to integrate the visual so you can you know, process it two different ways. Uh, okay, so the other aspect, uh, okay, so we acknowledge utility staples and big pharma had a hiccup in the past week or so. We showed that consolidation on the charts just now. We took the opportunity to top up some staples and pharma on the breather after a huge move since late February, early March when we initiated. There have been many public calls in the last few days and weeks for a 10 to 20% correction in the general indices. Uh, on Wednesday, Ryan Dietrich posted the worst six month statistics, which point to seasonal weakness in the next six months. You can see it right here, sell in May and go away. Everyone knows the cliche. Um, and this is part of the reason that we got ahead of the curve with Staples Utilities and Big Pharma several weeks ago. They're defensive groups where institutional money goes to hide during volatility. However, I don't anticipate a major correction that seems to be the recent consensus. And there's two reasons for my more moderated view. Certainly, we came out at the beginning of the year. We said this, we expect this to be a mid-teens year for the S&P. Now we're already up 10. So, you know, to have eight more months left and potentially only 5%, you're going to get some volatility, right? So otherwise, it would be like a basis point a day straight up. So you, you know, get a few percent up and you get a few percent correction. But we had anticipated no more than these mini three to five percent corrections. We've already had two in the general uh, indices. We think this is closer to a 2013 or 2017 type model where after a monster dislocation like we had last year, like we had in 2011 uh, and 12 and in 2016 before 2017, that, that recovery year tends to just grind up because people have to chase in. They were in disbelief and, and, and shell shock and they have to chase up and the higher it goes, the more reluctant they get forced back in. And that's just the nature of the structural setup in the market. But there are two other reasons why we're not that pessimistic, despite all the overboughtness and yada, 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 is that earnings estimates are still too low and coming up weekly. And this is extremely important this week because just a couple of weeks ago, estimates for 2021 were 175. You'll remember if you listen to this, and I said, these are going to go up dramatically. Wait till you see what happened this week. It's coming. <laughs> uh, that's going to be the surprise. It's the cherry on top of the Sunday at the end of this call. So stay tuned for the next uh, handful of minutes. Uh, so number one, estimates are still too low. And number two, money supply growth and stimulus is nearing 50% of GDP. This is more money than during FDR's New Deal when he paid people to dig up holes and fill them back in. So this is, you know, not the time to get excessively bearish. Certainly you don't want to get caught up in a euphoria and you don't want to be bidding up things that are overbid, but there's enough opportunity under the surface on a, on a quarterly basis where one sector gets thrown out with the bathwater, that's where we buy. These things are down 20 to 40%. And then the uh, overbought things roll over and the general indices kind of grind sideways to up. And that's kind of what we expect. And that's why the indices we said this year is not the game. It's the rallies under the surface. Now, when you look at the Dow in particular, a few indicators I look at are not pointing to extreme overbought situation at all. Um, you can certainly point out individual stocks in the Dow that are overdone. But there's some, there may be some gas in the tank here before some moderation. This is the uh, Dow Swenlin trading oscillator volume. But you can just see, look, I, I don't really care what these things say they are. I just care if they work, you know, greater than 70 or 80 percent of the time. And you can see that the odds favor when it's down at these level, the odds are favorable to being a buyer versus a seller. So you may get a little more bid in the Dow. Same thing with this uh, bullish percent. Again, it's not at these levels where you'd want to start to lay off some risk. It's more at the levels where you potentially want to be a buyer. We'll see how that plays out. Market's just been indecisive, grinding sideways. And that's been evident in uh, uh, sentiment here for retail people actually came down big this week. That was good to see. So that wall of worry can, can be rebuilt to climb uh, down from 57.52.7 to 42.6 bullish bearish shot up from uh, or climbed up from 20.5 to 25.7 percent bearish and you can see the bullishness starting to normalize 
Uh, fear and greed was at 61. That's a neutral reading. And then uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers. Let me just see if that's changed because that always seems to print the day after I do the article on Thursday. So that probably came, let's see, it's at 103.72. So that in fact climbed back up to here. So again, getting a little uh, exuberant here. We'll see how they are next week after these earnings. And our message for the week was this. Um, similar to last week's, uh, we covered utility, energy. We still like all of that. But with the market up 85% off the March lows, we're very selective where we put new money to work. We added two selective staples in pharma that took a, a breather this week. We talked about that already with uh, Kimberly Clark, with Novartis, a couple others. We think they're fantastic. Uh, if you look out six to nine months, I think it's just tremendous in my view. Um, and then we initiated very selective opportunities in Chinese stocks, New Deal, clean energy plays, and busted SPACs, which we said we would in last week's note and podcast video cast. You can click right there. Since we have lower confidence level in these groups than we had in our energy banks defense call last year and our utilities pharma staples call in February, we bought a basket. So, you know, whereas Wells Fargo, we had 20% of our portfolio, give or take, as a basis um and now it's you know a lot more and we have to you know shave modestly although we don't want to it's become so overweight you know, because of the appreciation you have to moderate the sizing of the position but that's a holder for you know we're in beginning of a new cycle so um so we you know we listed some of the big names we, we've already gone through baba las vegas alibaba las vegas sands melco crown iq who you do you etc and then a bunch of the warrants that we talked about most of them are already announced rolled over because the SPACs have rolled over and then we buy the 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 warrants that are left for dead some of them we bought stock but um and then some of them are on the hopes of a deal like eras etc but again a basket and we showed you last week where you can find them so you can do your own homework and see which ones you like so i think the most important thing with these SPACs number one is the jockey who's in charge do they have a track record of success in the industry that they're going to do this and then you can click on these warrant links to see what the warrant's done. And you'll see a lot of these had bottomed and now they're starting to rise, uh, but they're still very, very cheap. Bottom and started to rise. So the last week has been a major move and you know that was nice timing, but I think there's still some opportunity here. You can see there's quite a few. This, uh, and you can see not only these that are closed SPACs, you can see the ones that are, still haven't announced a deal SPACs. Um, but I, I don't, I, I think the better play, I know a lot of people say, oh, if I just buy these back warrants and they announce a deal, I'll get rich because it'll, it'll double on the deal. I don't think that's the case. I think what you want to do, let them announce, let the, let the mania chase it up to $20. And then when it rolls back over to 10 and the warrants are left for dead before they change the ticker and before they get their first earnings call in, I think that's the time when there's uncertainty the initial hype is gone, they're left for dead, and, and that's what was the case with DraftKings, and I think that's gonna be the case with a, a number of these that we were able to take advantage of uh, this week with the, the uh, busted SPAC thesis last week. So while the market seems to have no particular place to go, we have a clear path forward by shifting lanes as the opportunities present themselves. Uh, and there's just tremendous opportunity. We've covered so much this week. It's just like, you know, literally manna from heaven. Unusual options activity. There was a huge amount in Gilead today after they missed earnings. Someone bought 14,000 contracts of the uh, June 6750 calls. I don't like buying that short dated stuff. We covered why last week, but longer dated, I think there's an opportunity or just buy the stock and collect a four and a half percent dividend until it doubles over the next five years. So, I mean, why, why wouldn't you? Uh, Enterprise Products Partners, this is an MLP, 25,000 contracts, $15 call for January of 2023. This is a smart, long-dated play. This is the way you play options. Uh, kudos to whoever bought that. And then um, uh, American Electric Power, our favorite utility, along with Dominion. Someone bought a bunch of these for short-dated for June, 3,000 contracts at $95. So they're expecting some good news uh from their from their lips to god's ears i'll take it uh and then someone bought uh 50 000 contracts of, of city and by the way this day i only put out one there were blocks like i've never seen i mean it was 50 000 30 000 30 000 20 000 30 000 there was like eight huge prints of you know 20 to 
50,000 blocks of city calls uh, out to January, in this case, $40 call, some deep in the money, some at the money, et cetera, but a lot of deep in the money. Someone wanted a huge amount of exposure, which makes sense because if, if you remember the chart I showed, you know, it, it had um, moved up a lot and then, yeah, con consolidated sideways. So they're betting that it's going to take back off and break out to, to new highs here above the pre-pandemic. And, and I think that's probably a reasonable way to think about it. So kudos to them and uh, I'm glad we were able to notice that. Uh, earnings by sector, consumer discretionary, we did the top 30 weights and what's happened in the last 60 days, those earnings have come down in aggregate negative 2.36 for that uh, sector. Um, and then moving right along to earnings for the week. I mean, look, you know the, the basic story here. Um, earnings were much better than expected across the board. I thought this was an interesting Canon, a Japanese company beat on both. So that's good to see the global thing, despite Asia being slow on the uh, coronavirus. All the banks were great, even the regionals, New York Community Bank. By the way, I think they're buying another regional. So you're going to see a lot of deal work in the regional banks uh, consolidating. So there, there's an opportunity. Um, range resources beat on top and bottom. That's a natural gas producer in the Marcellus. I think those are going to start to play nicely. Um, uh, what else do we have here? Uh, 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 okay, that, so that was Monday. Tuesday, you had Microsoft and Google both beat on the top and bottom line. Um, Novartis missed, that's why it was down. But they, you know, they missed by two cents. And again, you didn't have the doctor's visits. And most of these drugs are either doctor administered or you have to go get the script. This whole big pharma group is going to start to sniff that out for the second half. It's going to be as big, if not bigger, than the commercial aviation recovery, which is going to help the GEs of the world and the Boeings of the world and all the defense stocks, which has been our thesis with the Raytheons and the general dynamics. And we've been talking about this for months, if you've been with us. So, uh, you know, people were down on, on GE because they missed on the top line, like like commercial aviation is never coming back. Grow up. It's coming back. It came back after 9-11. It's going to come back after a pandemic. That I can assure you. Um, there was an article on Fox Business that Durex condom sales are through the roof now that everyone's uh, getting vaccinated. Well, that tells you everything you need to know. I mean, the, the roaring 20s. Uh, you know, with uh, travel, le leisure, and hospitality, it's it's coming back. So these these companies are going to be well positioned to do that. Uh, any other highlights here? Let's see. Um, okay, Wednesday we had Apple and Facebook again, top and bottom line, but nuanced because what is the what is guidance look like? Boeing again in a little consolidation because uh, we we know why the hundred and thousand investigations and demand is just coming back online. That's the second half story. Um, and so just a tremendous amount of earnings. I, I, earnings were better. Now this is oh we're not quite there yet. Uh, oh let's go through the economic data quickly. Got to know what's going on. Um, Okay, Michigan consumer sentiment beat expectations, 88.3 versus 87.4. Uh, Chicago PMIs blew the doors off, 72.1 versus 65.3. Personal spending beat expectations, 4.2% month on month versus 4.1. Personal income up 21.1% versus 20.3%. Uh, and uh, core PC price index was higher than estimated. So again, these are things we'll watch moving forward. Uh, GDP came in better than expected uh, for Q1, 6.4 versus 6.1. Um, continuing jobless claims, you gotta keep an eye on this because no one's talking about it. And I talk about it all the time. I talked about it when in the, the late days of the Trump administration, you would see that initial jobless claims would be bad. And I said, don't worry about initial, worry about continuing. As long as that number keeps going down, we're okay. And now you're getting good initial jobs, but but the continuing keeps missing. So we gotta see this number coming down because that is the most important number when it comes. We're also gonna get the non-farm payrolls next week, which will be a, a better tell of everything. But keep an eye on this continuing jobless claims. I don't like this ticking up every single week. Um, so we gotta keep an eye on that. And this is largely a function, we know this, that we, all you have to do is turn on the TV and see business owner after business owner saying, I can't get laborers because 
they're making more money staying at home until September. God willing, that program does not get extended because it will destroy the economy. Uh, but, um, you know, people make rational decisions. If you're going to pay them more to stay home, even though people want the pride of work, I mean, a lot of people will take the higher money. And uh, if it means doing nothing, they'll go hiking, they'll catch up on their reading, maybe they'll learn a new skill. But um, the problem is, is they're going to be in a tough spot when they go back out to get a job when everyone else is doing that. I think the opportunity for smart minded people is to get in now when there's less competition and work your way up. So when the competition comes, you're already ahead of the game, but maybe people, not enough people are thinking long term. Um, but uh, this is, this is, you know, this is government caused right here. Um, okay, crude inventory is beat. This was good to see. It was a build of uh, 90,000 barrels versus 650,000 estimated. So that's good to see. And then, uh, okay, what else did we get? Consumer confidence blew the doors off, 121 versus 113 expected. So that's all good. Durable goods orders were a little soft month on month. So we'll keep an eye on that. And also were goods orders non-defense. X Air were also soft, 1.5 estimated, came in at 90 basis points. So keep an eye on that. But largely good economic data. And here is the cherry on the Sunday estimates catapulted higher this week um remember just a couple weeks ago i was saying this 175 is too low then it ticked up to 178 guess where it's at now 185 i was talking 190 you know maybe and uh and maybe as high as 200 but that was an outlier possibility well this week we're only in april 2021 earnings are now at 185.12 and 2022 have jumped from 202 to 207.41. So the thesis was correct. Estimates are too low. They're going to continue to climb higher. And that's why the multiples are going to look reasonable. And that's why when there are opportunities under the surface, we have to jump on them. So with that said, I want to thank you for listening in. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Make it a great one.